Good evening, Fiveable AP Stats students. Uh, my name is Shane Durkin. I am over in California, and I'll be helping you this year in order to get a five on the AP Stats exam. Uh, today, we are going to be working on describing location, which is going to be an important part moving forward in statistics. We're definitely going to see this come up in our later chapters. So it's important that we get a great start on it uh, tonight. I see we got Tyler in. Tyler, good to see you. Um, we'll connect more offline. Um, Tyler, can you just do a quick favor for me? Am I appearing on your screen as far as my, my face, my visuals, or is it only the PowerPoint? Awesome, awesome. Uh, well, pleasure to meet you virtually, Tyler. Um, like I said, we'll connect offline about future uh, stat stream is going to be important for you to come on in and help us out here. Um, but here's what I have planned for us today. Before we get started, you might hear a jet flying over me. I am in San Francisco. Uh, this is Fleet Week, so they are testing out all their jets before they go uh, and do the live thing on Saturday. So my apologize, my apologies if you hear that um, while we're while we're streaming. Um, but as always, go ahead and follow Fiveable, Think Fiveable, on all the different social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. That's where you're going to get a lot of our content. We're going to start delivering more content around blog posts and different readings to kind of help um, you throughout the year. That way you're using different resources, not just the live streams. And here's kind of what we're going to be doing today. Quick introduction uh, about how um, today's going to work. Then we're going to go into measure position using percentiles. Uh, something you've probably done in the past, but something we're going to solidify for the AP exam. There has been a change to that this year, um, and we're going to make sure we know the explicit definition of that. We are also going to look at interpreting cumulative relative frequency graphs. Uh, it comes up off maybe like once or twice a test. Uh, so something we do want to make sure that you are aware of so that when that question does come up, you, you know what to do. Then we're going to look at transforming data. So what happens to our key features of a distribution when we transform? And when I mean transform, I mean we're essentially taking every data point and doing something with it, whether it's addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division. And then the last thing is we're going to talk about a density curve. What does it mean? How do we describe it? Um, and how do we define it? That's kind of what we're doing today. So let's go ahead and dive into the first part of it. Again, if you have any questions at all, if it's tough to hear me, um, please, please, please go ahead and drop uh, those questions into the chat on the right. So here we go, slide one, measuring position. So this next chapter is all about figuring out where you are relative to all the rest of your data. So how do we describe the position of a data point in respect to everything else? And one way we like to do that is called the percentile. So one way to describe the location of a value in a distribution is to tell what percent of observations are equal to or less than that data point. Now that's where the change happened. Uh, in the past, it has just been less than. Now it's less than or equal to. Not a huge change when we get to larger data sets. It won't really make a difference. Uh, smaller data sets, it does. But statistics is kind of the fuzzy math, so it's not gonna. They're not gonna penalize you um, for for that mistake. Uh, that's kind of for calculus. They get a little bit more specific on that stuff. Stats, um, for large data sets, it's really not going to make a difference if it's that or that and below or just below. But the change has been made, and it's now the percent of observations that are equal to or less than that observation. So the p percentile of a distribution is the value with p percent of observations equal to or less than that observation. I'll show you a quick example with a small data set so we can get an idea. But just before we dive into that, you can think of like the 25th percentile. 
is where 25% of observations are equal to or less than that value. The median, the 50th percentile, right? Those are going to be synonymous. Here is our example. So Jerry earned a score of 86 on her test. How did she perform relative to the rest of the class? What percentile is she ranked in? So here we have all the data. We can see that data is normal. We can see that, or it's relatively symmetric, I should say. Uh, we could say that the center is somewhere in the 80s or late 70s. We could say that the spread is from 67 to 93. Those are all things from chapter one, but we do want to continue to exercise that, that muscle to make sure that when we come to the review or come to the midterm, that we're, we're comfortable with all that stuff that we did in the first chapter. Um, so she earned an 86. You can see I highlighted 86. Remember, this is a stem and leaf plot, which means six, seven. That represents a score of a 67. I will say this stem and leaf plot, I should have put a key. Any good stem and leaf plot has a key on the AP exam. If you ever come across or ever want to create a, a stem and leaf plot, just make sure you have a key. They will dock you if you do not have a key. Uh, so here, we're going to take a look. Where does she fall? Well, if we count the data points, and this is a small data set, so we can do that. But there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. There's going to be 25 data sets. So she falls on the 22nd data point. So 22 out of 25 is going to give me the 88th percentile. So Jerry fell in the 88th percentile. Super basic, but that's kind of what we're going to be doing moving forward, just with larger data sets. Um, percentile is going to be important. It tells you how many are at or below that value. So 88% of students scored at or below her level, which means 12% scored above her. Next thing we want to touch on is the cumulative relative frequency graphs. So there's a lot of words there. My students get tripped up often when it comes to cumulative relative frequency graph. So let's go ahead and break down those words. First, cumulative. So it's kind of like your cumulative GPA. It's everything added together. So cumulative means we add up everything before wherever we are. Um, so you can think of your cumulative GPA. Most of you are juniors or seniors. So it's everything added up to your this point right now. So it's all your grades added up to this point. Relative, how is, does it compare to everything else? And that's always key for percent, for proportion, or for fractions. Right? So relative is how does it in response to everything else. And then frequency is going to give me count. Right? So how often does it happen? So graph. So a cumulative relative frequency graph displays the cumulative relative frequency of each class in a frequency distribution. So you're going to see two graphs here. First, it's a histogram of scores. And so we can see they range from 0 all the way up to, it looks like maybe 20. Um, on the y-axis, you're always going to see frequency. Right? So how often does it occur? And then right below that is going to be the cumulative relative frequency graph. It's always going to start at zero, and the max is always going to be 100 or 1. So we cover all the data should fall between zero and 1. Right? That's where we're capturing the that's percentage. Um, and then below, you're going to see the score. So we can see that by the time we hit about 20, we've covered every single score. No data point is outside of 0 and 20. And if you look at about, um, let's see, what is that number? It's kind of blocking. At 10, 10 we have about 30%. And we see that because if I go up, directly up from 10, and then I go all the way across, it hits the 30% mark. What that means is 30% of our data is at or below 10. So that includes the 
Uh, looks like it's maybe one, two, or three down here. That includes the fives right there. Um, it includes everything up to 10. And so that number is going to continue to climb as more data points fall in that, uh, in that range. So that's cumulative relative frequency graph. We'll do another example of this with presidents at the end of the stream. All right, so now we're going to transform or we're going to transition to transforming data. So this tends to be a couple questions on the AP exam. They like to throw it in every now and then on a free response, A, B, C, or D. Uh, essentially, we can transform data in two ways. But first, let's talk about what transforming is. So transforming data converts the original observations from one unit to a different scale. Uh, it would be like transforming from inches to feet or from pounds to uh, tons, whatever, whatever it is that we're converting. That's how we transform data. It can also be something as simple as adding five to every data point or subtracting two from every data point. Some transformations can affect the shape, the center of the spread of a distribution. So similar to chapter one, we're still using shape, center, and spread to describe distributions. And when we transform data, those three key parts tend to be affected as well. Depends on what we do, and we'll dive into the specifics. Next slide. So transforming data is just doing some sort of manipulation to data. A lot of different reasons why you might do that, especially if you're a data scientist. Um, just depends on why you want to do that. So here I have two graphs of high school students. It's all the same data. So it's the same students. One is in feet, one is in inches. So you can see a couple things. One, the shape is the same. So the shape has not changed, even though it converted from feet to inches. Something to keep in mind. We'll form, we'll, we will formalize that in a little bit. Notice the range. So the range in my first is 1.25 feet. The range in my second is 15 inches. So that has changed. And notice the center. The center of my first distribution is around maybe 5.6. The center for my second distribution, inches, is maybe around 68, 67. So here's what happens when we add or subtract an observe, uh, add or subtract a constant to data. So if we add the same number, let's say it's A, it can be positive, it can be zero, it can be negative, to every observation that we collect, it's going to change the center and any other measures of center or any other measures of location. So mean is going to change. Median is going to change. Quartiles are going to change. Percentiles are going to change. And that's all going to change by an add of A. So if I add 5 to every data point, then the mean is going to shift up 5. The median is going to shift, shift up 5. The quartiles are all going to shift up 5, meaning if the 25th percentile was at 10 and I added 5 to every data point, the 25th percentile is now going to be at 15. So everything shifts up. It's just kind of taking your data and sliding it up. It's not going to change the shape of the distribution or the spread of the distribution. So range, IQR, standard deviation, that's all going to stay the same. The reason is because we're adding the same to every data point. So again, it's just going to kind of slide, whether we're adding or subtracting. This works for both. Let's take a look at an example. So let's say I gave a test, um, and I decided, you know what, two of the questions I didn't think were very fair. It was a 100-point test and two of the points I thought just weren't fair. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna give every single student two points on the exam. What's gonna happen to the mean? Well, the mean is gonna shift up two. So let's say the average was a 72 and then I added two points to everyone, that's gonna shift it up to 74. Median, same thing's gonna happen. If it was a symmetrical distribution, the mean and the median should be about the same. 
So let's say the median is also 72. And then I add two points to every exam. That's once again going to shift it up two points. So the median would be 74. Standard deviation is not going to change. The spread is going to stay the same. So standard deviation and range are all going to stay the same with whatever they were before we added or subtracted the constant. In this case, I added two points. So the standard deviation won't change. The shape is also going to remain the same. Again, whenever you add or subtract data, you're just kind of sliding it. So the only thing that's going to change is any measure of center or any measure of location. Spread and shape are going to stay the same. What happens when we multiply or divide? So multiplying or dividing by a constant, let's say that constant is B, whether it's negative, positive, or zero, it's going to change the center and any measure of location by a multiple of B, or if you divided by dividing by B. So let's say, uh, well, I have another example, but um, we'll come back to it. So it's going to change the center. It's going to change the location by a multiple or division of B. It's also going to change the spread by the absolute value of B, multiplying or dividing. So center is going to change. Spread is going to change. However, the shape is not going to change. So the shape is going to remain the same regardless if we multiply, divide, add, or subtract. But if we multiply or divide, the measure of spread is gonna change by the absolute value of B, and the measure of center is gonna change by the multiple of B. Let's look at an example. All right, here we go. So let's say I, let me close this. Perfect. Let's say I multiply the number of questions each person got correct by four on the exam. What would happen to the mean? Well, the mean would increase by a multiple of four. So if the mean was, uh, let's say 25, it's now gonna be 100. Median, same thing. It's gonna increase by a multiple of 20, or of 25 if it's, or a multiple of four, I should say. Uh, standard deviation, it's gonna multiply by the absolute value of four. The reason we do absolute value is because distance can't be negative, so we do the absolute value. Range, same idea. Spread, same thing. Ooh, that should be shape, sorry. So it's gonna be the shape of the distribution. The shape is gonna remain the same. Center and spread will change when we multiply. Shape will not change. We'll come back to these for um, at the end with a couple of examples. So here is the next part of our stream. It's going a little bit faster just because uh, we got to get some more people in here asking questions, but we'll, we will definitely get that number up as the year continues. Uh, so a density curve, a couple facts about density curves that we need to know. We're going to be using them a lot moving forward. It's important that we get a good foundational understanding. A density curve always is on or above the horizontal axis. So you're never gonna have a density curve go below the horizontal axis. It always has an area of one underneath it. Super important when we move forward next week in my next stream about Z-score. Um, always has an area of one and that's gonna be important when we wanna find certain parts of uh, the density curve. It also allows us to describe the overall pattern of a distribution. So if it's symmetrical, if it's skewed, if it's bimodal, it allows us to describe the overall pattern. And the area under the curve and above any interval of values on the horizontal axis is the proportion of all observations that fall in that interval. So we're always looking at proportions of data that falls in there. So if a certain if we're looking at a certain interval, we want to know how much data falls in there. It's always going to be the percentage that a density curve gives us, not the actual number. Let's look at a visual to help us out. So here's a density curve. It is the overall pattern of this histogram of the scores of 947 seventh graders on how they scored on a certain test in Iowa. 
and we can describe it by a smooth normal curve. Not perfect, very rarely do we get data that is perfect, um, but as we take more and more samples, we do get a more normal curve. So we can see that the whole, all the data points under the curve represent one, um, each interval represents the proportion of students. If I did uh, the density curve would represent the proportion of students that fall within that interval. So that's kind of the visual of it. A um, couple other important things, the mean and the median are the same for a symmetrical density curve. They both lie at the center of the curve. So looking back at our example, the median and the mean, since it is a symmetrical density curve, remember symmetrical means it's kind of the same on both sides. You could cut it in half and fold it over to get the same thing. So if it's symmetrical, then the mean and the median lie in the center of the curve and are generally the same. The mean of a skewed curve is pulled away from the median in the direction of the tail. So I'll show you an example of this in a minute. But if, it, if we do have a skewed distribution, like let's say it's skewed to the left, the mean is going to be pulled towards the tail, um, which is going to be pulled away from the median. Let me show you an example, a visual example. So here we have a normal density curve on the left-hand side. It is symmetrical, which means the mean and the median are going to be right in the middle, and they're going to be the same. Now, if we have something like the image on the right, that's gonna be skewed to the right. Remember, skewedness always follows the tail. So in this case, the tail leads off to the right, which means it's skewed to the right. So if something is skewed, the mean is gonna follow the tail. In this case, the mean is gonna be pulled to the right, which uh, leaves it higher than the median. So anytime you have skewed distributions, the mean is always gonna follow the tail. If it's symmetrical, the mean and the median are gonna be the same. All right, let's do a couple examples to test out what we just learned. Knott's Berry Farm is an old, or not, I guess it's not, well, it's pretty old, but I used to go there growing up in Southern California. I used to spend my summers there, but it's the amusement park, doesn't charge for general admission. That's actually not true, it just works for the problem, but doesn't charge general admission or for parking, but they do charge customers for each ride that they take. Below are the data on the cost for rides at Knott's Berry Farm. So we can see a couple things looking closely at the data. One, it's skewed to the right. We can see those data points out there at two, 250, and three, pulling the distribution to the right. So we know it's skewed to the right, which means our mean should be a little bit larger than our median. Let's look at the five number summary. Five number summary is located over here on the left in the middle. N represents the sample size. So that's how many, how much data we have. In this case, there are 22 rides. So we have 22 as N. Mean, gonna be the average 1.705. Let's compare that to the median, 1.5. Again, that makes sense because in this case, the distribution is skewed to the right which means the mean is gonna follow the tail and it's gonna be pulled up that way. So our mean is gonna be larger than the median. Standard deviation is 0.447. Again, we're just gonna to continue to remind ourselves, standard deviation is the average distance. Every one of these points are from the average. So looking at the average as 1.705, on average, each data point is about 0.447 away from that number. Q1 is gonna be the quartile, right? The 25th percentile, which falls at 1.5. So somewhere in there is the 25th percentile. Median, which is the 50th percentile, is gonna fall at 1.5 as well. Q3 is gonna be 1.75 and the max at three. So we have a range of 2.75, the center, the mean is gonna be at 1.7, and the shape is skewed to the right. Describing a distribution came from earlier. 
question for today though is suppose you converted the cost of the rides from dollars to cents. So we all know $1 is 100 cents. We want to know what would the shape, the average, and the standard deviation of the distribution uh, be in cents. So what happens if we converted, instead of dollars, we're converting to cents. So let's see. Well, here's what would happen. The shape would stay the same. It would still be skewed to the right. The shape does not change when we multiply our distribution. The mean and the standard deviation, however, are going to change. For example, the mean of our distribution was $1 and 70 cents, 70 and a half cents. It's now gonna be 170.5 cents. So we've now changed our mean and our standard deviation by a multiple of 100. When we multiply data, the shape is gonna stay the same. Median, or I should say center, and any other measure of center or location is going to be changed by a multiple of that number, and the spread is also gonna be changed. So as we look at the standard deviation, that would be changed by a multiple of 100. So instead of 0.447, it would be 44.7. Our minimum would also change. Instead of 1.25, that would shift up to 125. Our Q1, instead of being 1.5, would now be 105. Everything is just going to shift up, or 150, I should say. Everything is going to shift up by a multiple of 100. The only thing that's not going to change is the shape. What happens if the managers decide to increase the cost of every ride by 25 cents? So instead of, hey, we need to raise some more money, so we're going to do a flat increase across the board by a quarter. How would this change the shape, the center, and the variability of the distribution compared with the distribution earlier? in one. So now instead of multiplying by 100 or changing all the data points by multiplying, we are now changing all the data points by adding 25 cents. So how would that change? Well, all centers values would increase by 25%. So the new mean, instead of it being 170.5, it's now going to increase by 25 cents. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's going to shift up 25 cents. The mean, the median, Q1, Q3, all that is going to shift up by 25 cents. However, the shape is going to stay the same. We're still going to have a distribution that's skewed to the right. Also, any measures of variability like spread, IQR, um, standard deviation, all that will remain the same because all I'm doing is taking my data and shifting all of it up 25%, or sorry, 25 cents, I should say. So center and all locations are going to change by 25 cents. Everything else is going to remain the same. By everything else, I mean the shape and the spread. Let's practice cumulative relative frequency graphs before we go. So here are the age of the first 44 presidents when they were inaugurated. So on the left hand column we have age in intervals, looks like intervals of four, or I should say five, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, and then the next interval. The next is frequency. So how, how many times did this occur? Two presidents were between 40 and 44, when they were first inaugurated. Next to that is the relative frequency. So relative to every all the data points, what percentage is this? So from 40 to 44, it's two presidents out of 44, which is 4.5%. Uh, similar to, let's look at 50 to 54, there were 13 presidents who were when they were first inaugurated, were aged between 50 and 54. 
So 13 out of 44 gives me 29.5%. Now looking at that third column, here's where cumulative comes in. Cumulative means, again, everything added up before it. So our 40 to 44 is not going to change because there were no presidents born or, sorry, inaugurated at the age before 40. So it's still going to remain at 2. However, that next interval is going to take that 2 and add it to the 7 for the new um, interval. So now it's 9 out of 44. So we have from 45 to 49, we have that 7 plus the addition of the 2 from 40 to 44. And as we just continue on, we're adding the previous to the current. And that gives you the cumulative frequency. Moving one more column over, we have cumulative relative frequency graph, which just means we're turning that into a percentile. So again, that top one is going to remain the same because there was nothing before that. However, that next one is going to change. Instead of it being 7 out of 44, it now becomes 9 out of 44. The next one, same thing, 22 out of 44. So by 54, half of presidents, the first 44 at least, were inaugurated by 54. And because that's how percentages work, by the very end, we should have 100% down in the bottom right-hand corner. So all presidents, at least from the first 44, should have been or were inaugurated at an age of 69 or less. Now let's turn that into a cumulative relative frequency graph. Here's what that would look like. So let's break this down. So we can see that, let's see if I can write on this. So let's see if this point. So we can see right here, 100% of our first 44 presidents were inaugurated by 70. Um, let's just say what percentage of presidents were inaugurated by 60, so 60 or less. Well, we'll go to 60, we'll go all the way up. It's just below 80, we'll go all the way over. So it looks like maybe by 79, or sorry, Ooh, read that wrong. So by the age 60, we had about 79, 78% of our presidents inaugurated by that age. Uh, we can go to 50. So by age 50, about 20 or 21% of our presidents were inaugurated. And we can go back to our cumulative relative frequency chart to see that, right? About 20.5 were inaugurated by the age of 49. And we see that in our graph. 49 or 50 is right there, about just above 20. So if we wanted to know, hey, what is the, Barack Obama was inaugurated at 47, is that unusually young? Well, we can take a look. 47 falls right here. That's around maybe the 10th or 15th percentile, probably closer to 10. Is that unusual? Mm, not unusually young. We use, we use about 5% to say something is unusual. Um, so Barack Obama probably isn't that unusual. Estimate and interpret the 65th percentile of the distribution. So remember, with a cumulative relative frequency graph, the percentile is going to be on the y-axis. So if I wanted to know the 65th percentile, I'd go up here to 60. In between 60 and 80 is going to be 70, so right there. And then in between 70 and 60 is 65, so right around there. And I'm going to go all the way across to C and then go down. And we're going to see around 57 or 58. 60 would be the 65th percentile. So once again, going back to what we talked about earlier about percentile, that means by age 57, 58, 65% of the presidents were inaugurated by that age. So 57.5 or less, 65% of presidents were inaugurated. Uh, going up to, let's say, 90, we could say, 
maybe 64. So by the age of 64, 90% of the first 44 presidents were inaugurated. All right, five of all, that is gonna do it for me um, today on describing location of a distribution. Please go ahead and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. We're gonna be going live twice a week, Mondays, Thursdays. We might have another day as well, but for the most part, those are the days that we are gonna go live uh, to help you guys out this year with uh, AP Stats. We'll definitely bring in some FRQ reviews as well as some multiple choice reviews. So feel free to at us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube to let us know what you're looking for. Appreciate your time. Have a good one, and we'll see you next week.